Between August 1995 and March 1996, four women in Allapatta, Miami were tragically beaten to death and then set on fire. I thought, well, there's always a possibility that she might have burned herself smoking crack cocaine, but the blunt trauma worry. There was no reason why anyone should target them specifically, and yet someone did. The answer to this question takes us on a bizarre journey of black magic, curses, and fire. Today's story takes us to Alapata, a suburban neighborhood northwest of downtown Miami, Florida. Alapata has a diverse community of residents, including African American and immigrants from Central America, Cuba, and the Caribbean. It also has a booming textile economy and a thriving art scene, dubbed the New Wynwood. Alapata has a population of 48,000 residents. There is a very strong police presence because of the frequent shootings in the neighborhood, whose violent crime rate is about 125% higher than the average crime rate in U.S. neighborhoods. At the time of their murders, 42-year-old Vita Hicks, 44-year-old Diane Nelms, 37-year-old Cheryl Ray, and 37-year-old Janice Cox were local workers. No other details about their lives are known, except that they were all addicted to crack cocaine. On August 1, 1995, Detective De La Torriente from the Miami Police Department arrived at the scene where the body of 42-year-old Vita Hicks was found. He met the first responding officers. Already, a crowd of onlookers and nearby homeless people was forming. The body lay sprawled on the floor burned from the waist up. She was wearing a mesh shirt and a pair of shorts that were burnt so badly that the mesh pattern was actually burned into her body. She had also suffered a blow to the head. Initially, De La Torriente thought it was likely that she had accidentally set herself on fire while smoking crack cocaine, as he knew the area where her body was found was a hub of drug addicts. But the blunt force trauma to her head made him reconsider that option. So he cordoned off the scene with the yellow crime scene tape and prepared to investigate the case as a possible homicide. He sent Vita's body to the Dade County morgue for an autopsy. The autopsy revealed that Vita had suffered a severe injury to the head that caused a fractured skull and brain trauma. The blow to the head was determined to be the cause of death, and because she could not have suffered such a severe injury from an accidental fire, there was only one other option. Somebody had intentionally killed Vita Hicks and set her body on fire. Two months later, on October 1995, a worker at the Alapata Produce Market opened a bay door and stumbled upon a dead body. Detective Frank Castillo from the Miami Police Department and some officers responded to the scene, less than 30 feet from where Vita Hicks's body was found. They identified the body as belonging to 44-year-old Diane Nelms. She was lying face up and appeared to have the same injuries as Vita injuries to the face and head, a torso that appeared to be burnt. Detective Castillo immediately cordoned off the crime scene and sent the body to the coroner's office, although he could already tell that the cause of death was likely the head and face injuries. Soon after police began investigating Diane's death, they got another call that a dead body had been found at a cemetery about three miles from where the first two bodies were found. Detective Jack Calver from the Miami Police Department responded to the scene and became the lead detective. Like Vita and Diane, this body was beaten on the head and burned. She was 37-year-old Cheryl Ray. By this time, police had started to form a theory that a serial killer may be on the loose. All the evidence from the three crime scenes so far pointed to the same killer. The methods of killing were the same. The victims were all African-American women, and their bodies had all been burnt after they were killed. But this time, the killer made a mistake. He had left bodily fluid on Cheryl's body. On March 27, 1996, officers responded to a 911 call at 501 Northwest 29th Street, an abandoned gas station in North Miami. There was a partially nude dead woman lying on the floor, and her name was Janice Cox. The crime scene bore the same now familiar trademark as the previous scenes, wounds to the head and a burnt body. This time, however, Janice was lying next to a pool of transmission fluid. The coroner confirmed the cause of death as a fatal blow to the head. Inside the building at the gas station, the floor around Janice's body was littered with ceiling tiles that had fallen some time before Janice wound up there. This seemingly unimportant detail would be the break the detectives handling the four homicides would need to crack the case wide open. The ceiling tiles that the investigators found at the Janice Cox crime scene had landed with the white side up, 
The killer appeared to have stepped on the pool of transmission fluid found near Janice's body and then stepped on the ceiling tiles. According to Detective Nelson Andreo, one of the lead detectives in the case, the footprints were fresh, meaning they were likely the killer's footprints. Investigators also knew that, given the locations where the bodies were found, the killer knew the area well. During their investigation, police interviewed over 500 people, including passers-by, friends, and families of the victims. Meanwhile, investigators were already getting tips from locals about possible suspects. The most promising lead was an eyewitness account identifying a street thug named Dredd with Cheryl moments before she was killed. Police developed a composite sketch of Dredd and began circulating his picture in case anyone else had any information about him. But despite these promising leads, the case was not moving as quickly as the detectives believed it would. They had nothing tying Dredd to the crime scene, and his only relation to the case was being seen with the third victim shortly before she was murdered. However, Detective Callius believed that the police already had enough to catch the killer, so he set up an operation to find him. On the first day of this operation, he and his partner, Detective Nelson Andreo, would receive a tip to give them the break they needed to close the case. A woman named Yolanda approached Detective Callius, claiming she had information that he might be interested in. Yolanda, a sex worker, said that about a year before these murders, a guy had approached her to solicit her services. The guy had asked her if she spoke Spanish, and when she moved closer to him to respond, he hit her head with a metal pipe. Yolanda started running for her life. Luckily, she escaped her attacker and ran into a gas station where she called 911 and reported the incident. After hearing what she had to say, Detective Callius thanked Yolanda and asked her to call him if she remembered anything else or if she saw her attacker. In truth, he did not think much of her story, as it had happened a year ago and likely had nothing to do with the present case. But just three hours later, Callius received a call from Yolanda. She had just seen her attacker riding a bicycle in town. Hoping for a break in the case, Detective Callius and his partner went to pick Yolanda up to try and locate this random man riding a bicycle. Together, they drove through the streets of Miami until Yolanda pointed out, there he is. And we're going around, all of a sudden, she points out, she goes, there he is. Callius stopped the man and began questioning him. His name was Francisco Del Junco, and there was something suspicious about his manner. Hanging from Francisco's bike was a plastic bag with a juice bottle containing gasoline. It just so happened that in all four murders under investigation, gasoline was the accelerant used to set the bodies on fire. It seemed strange to Callias and his partner that a bike without a motor needed a bottle of gasoline. When asked about it, Francisco claimed that his bicycle chain usually fell off, and when he tried to fix it, he would get grease on his hands, so he used the gasoline to wash the grease off his hands afterward. This explanation did not satisfy Detective Andreo, so he asked Francisco if he could see the bottom of his shoe, and sure enough, the shoes had that elusive footprint impression found at the crime scene where Janice Cox's body was found. The detectives, feeling they had a strong enough reason to place Francisco on the suspect list, asked him to come down to the station with them, and he agreed. During the interview, Francisco was cordial with the detectives, but he did not admit to being involved in the murders. Andreo asked Francisco if he knew why somebody would murder these women. He replied that it was impossible to know what drives people to do things like that. So the detectives kept suggesting reasons why someone would commit these crimes, hoping to notice a change in his attitude, an admission, a slip-up, or anything, but Francisco maintained his innocence. And then, out of nowhere, Andreo mentioned Santeria. Immediately, Francisco's mood changed. Santeria. Santeria. Santeria, or Regla de Ocha, is a religion practiced in Miami in the Caribbean. It is a mixture of the traditional Yoruba religion of West Africa, Catholicism, and Spiritism. People who practice this religion are known as creantes, or believers. Detective Andreo knew immediately that he had struck a chord and he could feel the puzzle pieces falling into place. And he says, what did you say? And I said, Santeria. And basically his demeanor changed and he says, can we go somewhere else to talk? And I said to myself, bingo. Francisco wanted to go to the beach to talk and Andreo was all in. At the Miami beach, Francisco began telling the detectives a strange account of his life. According to him, he was battling a condition whereby he would be going about his normal daily activities and then suddenly become aroused. 
and then, without any provocation or stimulation, he would ejaculate. Francisco told the detectives how embarrassing and debilitating this condition was for him. He believed it was all the fault of the Santeria priestesses, who created the voices in his head, and their leader was a black woman, so he targeted black women to get even with the Santeria priestesses. The detectives were having a hard time deciding whether Francisco was truly delusional or if he was telling this story as an excuse for the crimes he was about to confess to. So they needed to look into his past to understand who he was and possibly give clues as to his mental state. Francisco del Junco was born on August 3, 1957 in Cuba. He was the first child of his parents who had a history of mental illness. As a result, Francisco also had mental struggles from a very young age. He developed epilepsy at age three and had to begin taking medication for it. Francisco's family was highly dysfunctional and his childhood was rough, but he was educated until the fourth grade. His parents had begun having marital issues soon after they got married, which eventually resulted in a divorce. His father left the family, ignoring Francisco for the rest of his childhood. A therapist later noted that Francisco's childhood was characterized by rejection of others by being different, isolated. When Francisco's mother remarried, her new husband, who became Francisco's stepfather, would constantly abuse him. He also had problems relating with his peers and others outside his family. Still, Francisco had an okay relationship with his mother, and some of his best memories were going to the beach with her. As Francisco grew older, his mental health began to deteriorate. By 16, he began hearing voices in his head that he claimed were caused by black magic being done by some priestesses. The voices in his head made him paranoid, afraid that someone was trying to kill him. He began distancing himself from others as a result. In 1980, Francisco moved to Miami via a Mariel boat lift, which was the period between April 15th and October 31st, 1980, when Cubans emigrated via boat to the U.S. due to Cuba's poor economy. When he arrived in Miami, Francisco began living with some relatives while working multiple jobs. He also began to receive medical attention for his mental illness. He regularly visited a psychiatrist whom he told about the voices in his head and how he often saw images of black ladies or Santeria, priestesses of black magic. He also told a psychiatrist that he often had homicidal thoughts because he was delusional and expressed his frustration about being unable to channel his energy like he wanted to. In 1987, when he was 30 years old, Francisco was admitted to a mental health clinic for the first time. He was admitted again in 1988 and 1992, when he was 31 and 35 respectively. Meanwhile, Francisco held different jobs to support himself. His last job was at Dan Marino Sports Bar and Grill in Coconut Grove. His employers regarded him as a quiet but model employee. He worked hard, was never late, and often rode to work on his bicycle. As an adult, Francisco had overcome some of his childhood awkwardness and could engage in casual romantic relationships. However, he deliberately avoided getting into any serious relationship because he knew the problems he was dealing with and he did not want any further complications in his life. Between when he was first admitted in 1987 and 1995, he had several run-ins with police for petty crimes ranging from assaulting an officer to burglary, loitering, and theft. On one occasion in 1987, Francisco swung a chain at one police officer and attempted to take a gun from another while shouting in Spanish, long live Fidel, long live communism. But despite Francisco's priors, the judge deemed him not a threat to society, mostly because of the guarded prognosis he had received from his psychiatrist. A guarded prognosis for Francisco meant that the psychiatrist did not have enough information to accurately determine whether or not Francisco could be a threat to the community in the future. The fact that Francisco missed his last appointment scheduled for January 1993 with his psychiatrist did not stop the psychiatrist from administering the guarded prognosis. The fact that Francisco missed his last appointment scheduled for January 1993 with his psychiatrist did not stop the psychiatrist from administering the guarded prognosis. The judge, relying on this, ruled that Francisco would not threaten society. Perhaps if Francisco had not missed that last appointment, the psychiatrist might have had a different opinion, which might have influenced the judge differently. But he did miss the appointment, and so when his victims met him, they believed they would get free drugs in exchange for their services. But what they couldn't possibly have known at the time was that the man soliciting their services in exchange for drugs would be the last client they would ever take.
Francisco confessed to Detective Andreo and Detective Callias that he did not commit the murders because he was a racist, but rather because he got a sense of relief and satisfaction from it. However, the detectives were still skeptical about his confession, so they needed to verify his account by asking him questions about the murders that only the killer would know. Francisco decided to revisit all the crime scenes to show the detectives that he was not lying. The first stop was where he placed the second body, the produce market, near the railway tracks. Next, Francisco led the detectives to the cemetery where Cheryl Ray's body was found. There he demonstrated how he carried out the crime in detail and explained how he lured his other victims to a secluded area before killing them. With this, the detectives believed he was telling the truth. Meanwhile, the detectives could not eliminate Francisco's boots as the one that made the footprints at the Janice Cox crime scene, meaning it could have been him. The final nail in the coffin for Francisco is the DNA from the body fluid recovered at the Cheryl Ray crime scene. On June 3, 1996, police arrested him and charged him with four counts of murder. With the overwhelming evidence against Francisco, the task for the judge at the Dade County Circuit Court was to determine whether he was responsible for his actions or he was legally insane and, therefore, not guilty. Under Florida law, for a defendant to qualify for the defense of legally insane, he must not know the difference between right and wrong. However, despite his bizarre behavior, it was evident from his confession that he understood the difference between right and wrong. But Francisco's defense lawyer told the judge that he was never adequately treated for his mental illness, so his actions resulted from an undiagnosed mental health condition. After a six-week trial that began in May 2003, Miami-Dade County Judge Alex Ferrer found Francisco Del Junco guilty of four counts of first-degree murder. He was not eligible for the death sentence because of his mental illness, so he received four concurrent life sentences without the possibility of parole. Now 66 years old, Francisco Del Junco is serving his sentence at the Miami-Dade County Jail. His victims have received justice, and their families can now move on with their lives. Francisco's life was a series of tragedies that all contributed to his mental health and psychopathic behavior. However, the only crimes his victims committed was encountering the man who would take their lives from them. Do you think Francisco should have been ruled legally insane? Do you think he committed those crimes because he did not get adequate treatment? We'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments. Also, don't hesitate to share any topic you want us to discuss in the next video. If you enjoyed today's story, hit the like and subscribe buttons and turn on post notifications.